it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Antero. He had already been at work on the Baltimore Sun for three years when I came there in 1972. And as a someone struggling to learn how to spell his own name as a fledgling reporter, I was blown away by this guy from Finland who could write in English on such a high level, covering everything from education to religion to Moscow to South Africa, the Sun's first South African reporter. And simultaneously, I believe he was writing a column on America for Helsinki's leading daily. And we always wondered what he was saying about us. He uh, would never provide us with a translation. But there, there were a lot of talented people at the Baltimore Sun. Uh, but Antero brought a unique perspective to coverage there that I, I don't think even the best of us American reporters had. He, he really approached America, particularly the subject of race, uh, in Baltimore as a, as a foreign correspondent. He came without baggage, without the cultural embeddedness most of us had, and it, it showed. He was just a, a unique and stellar addition to the staff there, and he's continued writing books uh, in that same vein. I, I do remember a couple things. He, the one time his English met its limits, he had his dad over here from Finland. His dad knew just enough English to call me chicken man because he knew I was from this area. And, uh, and Taro was trying to translate English to Finnish to English with some Smith Island waterman talking about crab sex and shedding out soft shell crabs. And that was that was pushing his limits, I think, as a translator. The, the one final thing I do recall, I, I'm sure he just scratched the surface with this, but I asked him once what he found surprising and fascinating about this country, and he, he said right off a couple things. One, a country that keeps celebrating over and over its bloody civil war. He said most of us try to forget those things. And the other was you can buy a gun in the classified ads in the newspaper. That he found fascinating, and I'm sure that's just part of a long list. But let me introduce Antero Piatella, my good friend. Thank you, uh, Dean uh, Parabom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I am going to uh, speak about uh, transitions in Baltimore first, and then we are going to talk about uh, questions that that uh, you have uh, on your mind. And so, uh, wh what I hope is that this is a very Baltimore-centric uh, presentation. And when I prepared the speech, I wanted to make it as understandable to people who may not be necessarily familiar with Baltimore. And I hope that you can follow me. If, if you cannot, please ask questions. From white marble steps to the city of the wire to Freddie Grace Baltimore, how did this transformation happen? We have to go back to the great Baltimore fire of 1904 to answer that question. The firestorm incinerated some 1,500 buildings and businesses on 140 acres. Of particular interest to us tonight is this. The Great Fire led to the redrawing of Baltimore's racial map, unleashing forces and dynamics that have molded the city ever since. Let me illustrate what I mean. The fire began with a carelessly discarded cigar or cigarette near where the Royal Farms Arena stands today, a few blocks north of the Orioles ballpark. Half a mile east was City Hall, located where it is today. Surrounding hilly and narrow streets had gone through a number of ethnic and class rotations, emerging as the hub of Baltimore's black community. Celebrated African-American churches had sanctuaries there, seating a thousand or more. The Masons and other fraternal organizations had their meeting halls there. But although most of the city hall area escaped the fire, it did not survive the aftermath. Overnight, displaced businesses gobbled up all real estate for their temporary operations. Blacks were evicted. 
the, municip the municipal government then joined the action. After the fire district was rebuilt, several mayors launched a Negro removal project, the first such governmental project certainly in Baltimore and possibly in the nation. The city simply condemned the area. By the late 1920s, tall office buildings had replaced the black community, which make, migrated in two directions. One thrust penetrated near northwest. Bethel AME, Union Baptist, and St. James Episcopal, three elite congregations, followed the colored high school, today's Douglas, to the Pennsylvania and Druid Hill Avenue corridors. The other migration went eastward. St. Francis Xavier, the nation's first Catholic church for blacks, moved there to the east side of the Jones Fall, falls the stream dividing the city. As to the colored normal school, which trained black teachers, it moved farther away to Prince George's County, to be exact, where it became today's Bowie State University. This dispersal was already in motion when the fire struck. The process had started soon after Democrats, the erstwhile party of slavery, regained City Hall in 1899 under the slogan, this is a white man's city. Until blacks headed to the Pennsylvania and Druid Hill Avenue environs, that territory was so dominated by Bohemians, German speakers from the Austro-Hungarian Empire that public schools there conducted instruction partially in German. Now those immigrants were thrilled as black families moved in and in moving uh, they were facilitated by, by the fact that uh, suddenly streetcars no longer were pulled by, by uh, horses but were motorized so it was easy to move. Leading black institutions, the Afro-American newspaper and the NAACP, joined the migration, as did doctors and dentists. The speed and the scope of racial change was breathtaking. In the ward where Pennsylvania and Druid Hill Avenues are located, black population increased from 1,499 in 1900 to 12,738 in 1910, and then to 16,738. 36 over the following decade. Meanwhile, the number of whites fell from 18,926 to 10,946 and then to 3,900. Pennsylvania Avenue's glory days came immediately after World War II. With jobs plentiful and people earning good money, the avenue was a swinging place. Every night there was a Saturday, and Saturdays were Mardi Gras. All jazz greats performed there, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, you name it. Many stars had Baltimore roots, Billie Holiday, Cap Calloway, and of course, Chick Webb, the hunchback drummer whose big band featured a singing sensation he discovered, Ella Fitzgerald. Since the big Howard Street department stores prohibited blacks from making purchases until the 1960s, Pennsylvania Avenue became the main retail strip. Such black businessmen that existed had their offices there, people like William L. Adams, the numbers kingpin who became a venture capitalist nicknamed Little Willie. It was a strange situation. Whites owned most stores on the avenue and the best restaurants there only seated whites. Blacks could order a carryout at the back door, yet their patronage kept the avenue going. So this is how the district was transformed, uh, the district that decades later became, uh, became the, the scene for the wire and, and where Freddie Gray lived and died. But back to the 1904 fire. In the aftermath, another population migration headed for the east side. Thousands of black families from the city hall area, ordinary folks streamed to the area between the harbor, the Maryland Penitentiary, and the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Gradually, they replaced the white immigrant groups 
which had rotated through the area since the 1800s. The Old Town section was the heart of Baltimore's Irish community, which now headed north and northeast along York, Harford, and Belair roads. As to the Jews of Old Town, they moved uptown to the west side. By the 1930s, March of East Baltimore was so run down that it had the city's worst slum. Official documents called it slum number one. A Sun reporter wrote about slum number one. Quote, it is not teeming with life. A walk through slum number one gives one the impression rather of a city in ruins half deserted. Hundreds of houses lie vacant and many of them are wrecked and ready to be ready to cave in. Sounds familiar. This description was from 1933. Some two dozen blocks away were leading hospitals. One was Hopkins, the other one was Sinai. In 1945, Sinai announced plans to move to near the Pimlico racetrack in the northwest, where the Jewish community was concentrating. White churches joined the exodus to the suburbs, but Johns Hopkins Hospital stayed. The movement of blacks to the Pennsylvania and Druid Hill corridors placed them next to the Jewish community. It was an uneasy coexistence that eventually led to the withdrawal of the Jewish residents. A standard neighborhood rotation pattern emerged from Christian white to Jewish white to African American. That pattern describes today's Liberty High Avenue, Garrison Boulevard, Ricestone Road, Park Heights Avenue, and of course, Liberty Road, home of the largest concentration of blacks in Baltimore County. The initial stages of black migrations created the confrontations that produced Baltimore's 1910 residential segregation. The law that the city council enacted was the first one in the nation. It was soon copied in such southern cities as Richmond, Atlanta, Louisville, Oklahoma City, New Orleans, Dallas, and so on. Like Baltimore, those cities were trying to cope with the influx of blacks. Great migration, it became called. As millions of blacks migrated in search of jobs, northern cities attempted to curb the spread of blacks to white neighborhoods by any means. Chicago's leading black bank banker had his house firebombed six times in 1920. Yet the Great Migration continued. The reason World War I interrupted European immigration, and once peace returned, the US government abandoned its unrestricted immigration policy instead of welcoming the huddled masses, strictly enforced eugenic quotas were introduced. They favored Northern European professionals, craftsmen, farmers, and entrepreneurs. Whites did not want black neighbors. The arguments ranged from biblical grounds to health reasons. Indeed, this was the peak time of tuberculosis and other communicable diseases. By segregating blacks and fencing them in ghettos, whites hoped to protect themselves against disease. Homeowners signed legally binding contracts known as restrictive covenants, which barred blacks, and not only blacks, but also Jews and sometimes Italians, Syrians, and Armenians. Meanwhile, from Baltimore to Los Angeles, from Miami to Minneapolis, from Norfolk to Seattle, the US government assumed national leadership in encouraging racial and social separation. In the mid-1930s, the government redlined 230 big cities, including Baltimore. It mapped each city and divided into areas where lending was encouraged or discouraged. Redlining grew out of a New Deal attempt to stabilize a Depression-era housing market. It raided neighborhoods' credit risk on the basis of the age and condition of housing stock but also according to residents' race, religion, ethnicity, and class. Maps were color-coded from lowest to the highest risk, green, blue, yellow, and red. Red was 
hazardous. In troubled economic conditions, huge numbers of homeowners defaulted. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's bailout agency, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, supervised the actual mapping. Its guidelines reflected the thinking of Homer Hoyt, the Federal Housing Administration's chief economist. Relying on the judgments of a Chicago real estate man, he listed ethnicities in the order of their desirability as homeowners, neighbors, and lending, uh, lending risks. And this is his list from his 1933 PhD dissertation at the University of Chicago. One, English, German, Scots, Irish, Scandinavians. Number two, North Italians. Number three, Bohemians or Czechoslovakians. Number four, Poles. Number five, Lithuanians. Number six, Greeks. Number seven, Russian Jews of the lower class. Number eight, South Italians. Number nine, Negroes. Number 10, Mexicans. Hoyt's list of preferred ethnicities became the nation's real estate and banking gospel for decades. It kept reappearing in appraisal manuals until the 1960s. Being a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or at least sharing WASP aspirations and values, was hoisted up as the American ideal. In city after city, homeowners of English, German, Nordic, and Irish ancestry occupied the neighborhoods deemed to be the most desirable, a map category colored green. Those residents tended to be old stock or at least native born, well off and educated and mostly Protestant. They barred blacks and Jews from their neighborhoods through legally enforceable joint agreements called restrictive governments, a strategy that the government recommended for combating inharmonious elements. The next category, blue, was broader. It included some upscale Jewish suburbs which maintained their homogeneity by barring blacks and Jews of different origin and lower social standing. The federal government told bankers to go ahead and lend prudently in those two top categories. Distinguished WASP families tended to live far from matting crowds in new garden districts built on one-time estate lands north of the Johns Hopkins University's Homewood campus. Months before the city council's segregation law in 1910, the Roland Park Development Company made every homeowner sign legally binding agreements to exclude blacks. Three years later, it stringently enforced a company policy that ended any further sales to Jewish families. Half a dozen high visibility Jewish families lived in Roland Park, big manufacturers and bankers. When they vacated their homes, they could only sell to Christians that the development company approved. For the next half century, no Jews lived in Roland Park. When the Roland Park Company inaugurated its Guilford subdivision, the city's uh, choices in 1913, that spread of stone and brick mansions in park-like surroundings also banned blacks and Jews. The Homeowners Loan Corporation redlining maps gave it the top ranking green. Roland Park, by contrast, only merited the second rank, still desirable or blue, even though it shared identical restrictions. The reason was the age of housing. The garden district had been inaugurated in 1891 Thus, the oldest Victorian homes constructed of wood had been built more than 45 years earlier. By the government's 1937 rec reckoning, those homes were time-worn and held little long-term appeal for status-conscious homebuyers who sought to project success. The homes were like a 1935 automobile, still good, but not what people are buying today who can afford a new one a document explained. Nevertheless, the government encouraged lending in both blue and green areas. From downtown to North Avenue and as far, as, uh, as far up as Waverly along Greenmont Avenue, 
All residential neighborhoods of any race were colored red between Fulton Avenue in the west and Patterson Park Avenue in the east, and again in Highland Town and Canton. Lenders were cautioned against doing business in such neighborhoods. Among redlined areas were neighborhoods that have since come back, Mount Vernon, Utah Place, Bolton Hill, Reservoir Hill, Station North, Charles Village, Remington, Butchers Hill, and South Baltimore, as the Federal Hill area was called. Those were white neighborhoods then and are predominantly white today. Race did not matter. Applicants in those white neighborhoods and dozens elsewhere were subjected to the same clampdown on lending that was imposed on black areas where no conventional financing took place. In most hazardous or red areas, it is difficult to see how any improvement can take place, was the homeowners loan corporation's verdict. That became a self-fulfilling prophecy as loan money at any terms dried up. Residents were left at the mercy of loan sharks and assorted improvement scammers. Deterioration set in. Beyond the red-lined areas lay transitional zones. They were colored yellow. The government classified them as risky for lending because it said their eventual fate was to be redlined. In this thinking, transitional neighborhoods went in only one direction, downward. There was no consideration of an alternative course encouraging lending and improvement in declining neighborhoods. The bankers, planners, and bureaucrats of the day did not know such a word as gentrification, the very idea of investing in down at heels or racially mixed neighborhoods would have sounded wacky to them. Their thinking was grounded in the rotation theories of the trailblazing Chicago School sociologist Robert E. Park, who posited that once a neighborhood lost its luster, less desirable elements succeeded one another. Cities, Park argued, expanded in concentric circles outward, with the most desirable and ambitious groups steadily moving farther out. At the end of the cycle, there would be no longer an economic reason for a given neighborhood to exist, and it would be raised and redeveloped for a better use. Ethnic, racial, and economic uh, rotations continue to our day, as do class rotations. Those rotations produce the city of the wire. Freddie Grace Baltimore is notorious for multiple dysfunctions, including lead poisoned housing, inferior schools, and the lack of manufacturing jobs. I'd like to end with an optimistic note. Regrettably, that is not possible. 13 Democrats are running for mayor, and Baltimore hasn't uh, elected any, any Republicans in 60 years. Uh, the challenges facing them are awesome. Uh, just an example. For years, the city has been under a federal mandate to update its aging and decrepit water lines, including wooden ones. Uh, they were built in 1915 when Baltimore, at, the point, at that point, the nation's seventh largest city, uh, inaugurated a water and sewer system. And it, it was at that point, it was the largest city with, with, without such a system. And little has been done in, in uh, this infrastructural updating in, in these recent years. Uh, and, and the reason is very clear. It is cost, it's going to cost the city at least a billion dollars and the city doesn't have that kind of money. So, Baltimore could be the next Flint, except on a far wider scale, because it also distributes water to several suburban counties. So this is my take on Baltimore tonight, and at this point, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to entertain any questions that you have on your mind. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Uh, hi. So I'm not, uh, I've never lived in Baltimore and I have just lived on the Eastern shore. And I'm wondering over the time span of your reporting and living in the Baltimore region, how you think this kind of forced segregation that is infrastructural has played out in other ways around the city. So the growth patterns of say universities or the economic spread of suburban sprawl and in which direction or interior implosion as the case may be? Uh, that's a very good question. Now there, there is uh, lots of literature about certain cities that fall in that category, Atlanta, uh, Kansas City, and so on. And I think that uh, much more will be coming out in, in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, the, the way research is conducted these days has uh, totally changed. When I was uh, researching, not in my neighborhood, uh, I had to go to libraries and archives. Now I can do 80% of that from home. And it is searchable. And, and so, uh, uh, so uh, that is not an answer to your question, but it, it underlines uh, one, one thing I want to underscore, and that is that uh, I think that these kinds of phenomena happened in many cities. Now, whether those cities have been studied is another matter. Uh, let me just give you one concrete example. In, in Not in my neighborhood, I talk about classified ads in the Baltimore Sun that uh, advertised properties for sale or rent and stated uh, whites only, uh, no blacks or no Jews. Uh, that has been uh, greeted with some amazement and, and people have been wondering whether it happened in other cities. I don't know any other city, but I presume that it happened in many other cities. Nobody just has, has uh, researched it. When you, in, I get it from the, what you said is you're talking of residential areas. I am, yes. Whereas, could you uh, speak to the location of industries in reference to those areas? Were there industries located close to those areas that utilized the help that was there? Say in the black community, was they, could you speak to that? Yes. Thank you. That is another good question because uh, the question of the location of black areas relative to industries and job creators became a matter of great controversy during World War II. Uh, Baltimore was a major center of defense industry. Many of the, uh, well, the, the big, uh, there were a couple of big players in Baltimore. One of them was Bethlehem Steel, which operated the world's largest steel mill in uh, Sparrows Point, and, and also several uh, several uh, shipyards. And, and so the question was, uh, because of federal orders, those companies had to hire blacks. And, and so the question was, where would those blacks live? And so when, when the federal government first started providing war housing, for defense workers and later public housing. There was lots of controversy as to, uh, as to their location because whites in, in, in the east, southeast Baltimore area where, where uh, Bethlehem Steel's uh, main operations were located or in Baltimore County where Glen L. Martin was located and both of these, uh, both of these main, uh, major companies, they, they uh, employed more than 50,000 uh, people. Uh, so, so on the one hand, the federal government wanted the workers to be nearby. On the other hand, the neighborhood said no. 
And so, so we have we have several controversies about that question, and it is it is very interesting to see that Baltimore County, which is a separate jurisdiction from the city, has never had public housing on its um, uh, territory, with one exception. It had public housing during the war, operated by the city housing city housing authority. By 1954, all of, all of that public housing was gone. They did not want any, any, any intrusion of blacks in areas that were seen as whites. I, I don't know whether this answers your question, but I, I think that that gets, gets uh, a little bit closer. You mentioned that the uh, federal government has directed the municipal government of Baltimore to replace the water lines. Um, has the federal government given any timeline for this? And should the city decide to carry it out, can you see any way the city can raise the funds vis-a-vis -vis tax hikes? Well, that, that's another interesting question, and it, it uh, really uh, is a, a wider question than, than what you stated, because as, you, as, as we all know, uh, water is becoming one of the scarcest and most expensive commodities in many places. I mean, we are running out of drinking water. And so uh, what this does, a uh, couple of phenomena can be, can be detected. And one of them is that there is lots of investment now in waterworks. When cities like Flint, and I'm, I'm using it gener generically, but when a city in financial distress is trying to figure out where to get money to cover its, its budgets, uh, suddenly uh, investors go to that city and says, but you have the water system, why don't you sell it to us? And that is now happening on a, on a uh, major scale. I, I don't think that it has been... Uh, it has been uh, covered in the press uh, that much, but one of the big players is uh, Veolia, which is a French multinational corporation. It is a French multinational co corporation which is gobbling up uh, water systems all over the place. It is just one of, one of the, the companies doing this. And so... Um, uh, I, I am not sure to what extent the, I mean, I mean all, all, all these kinds of uh, mandates in the end are negotiable or at least appealable. Now, now, what is clear is that the city must improve its water system. Uh, where the money eventually is going to come is still being negotiated. But, but it's, 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 uh, it is a situation that certainly has gained urgency now because of Flint. I mean, everybody, everybody is now uh, very clear about the hazards that, that uh, occur in that kind of situation. Now, let me, let me uh, broaden this discussion a little bit. Because uh, the problem in Flint was lead. And Baltimore's problem is lead as well. And it is a strange situation, and I'm still researching and trying to understand it. And here is what I know so far. The first studies that connected the ill effects of lead paint uh, were conducted in Queensland, Australia, around 1907. The first American studies were conducted at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore around 1917. In the mid-1930s, Baltimore City's health commissioner, who then was also in charge of housing, a very powerful uh, medical doctor named Huntington Williams, he ordered the city's public housing units to, to stop using lead paint. And so when we now have suits against the housing authority for allegedly having lead painted uh, units, I'm just kind of wondering what happened in the, uh, in the intervening years. I mean, I mean, there was this order in the mid-1930s to cease and desist. 
did it restart? And I'm still trying to figure out what happened. But what is, what is interesting in this context is that, to my knowledge, Baltimore is the only city in the U.S. where lead paint litigation has become a form of organized crime. It is an organized crime conducted by litigators, lawyers, who, who are scouting for, for, uh, for, for, for plaintiffs and, and, and who, who, who uh, try to identify landlords with, with uh, assets so that it would be worthwhile to take the, uh, for them to take a case on speculation. And so if you have been following, following uh, the Washington Post, they had a story recently which describes the dilemma in, in Baltimore. The, 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 rule of the, the name of the game in housing litigation, left paint litigation, is that in a city like Baltimore, you are about to hit hit um, uh, the jackpot if you can get your uh, your case before a jury, because then you can you can actually have Mr. Landlord here and the defendant here, and you can say, "Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, look at this man here, Mr. Landlord. Look at this poor defendant here." who has been damaged forever. Don't you think that this defendant is entitled to something? And, and in these situations, uh, the, the awards are uh, quite substantial. I have a friend who was a longtime landlord. Uh, he just got a, a verdict, $7 million. Now, now, that is totally meaningless because there is a, a state-ordered cap on, on lead paint awards. But that's how the jury felt. Now, I mentioned the Washington Post, and this is why you should go and, and uh, search the Washington Post. In a poor city like Baltimore, this racket has, has acquired the following dimension. Since many of these cases are done on speculation, because the defendants, I mean, the plaintiffs don't have any money for, for um, paying for the lawyer up front, there is a phenomenon in Baltimore where lead paint uh, plaintiffs sign their possible award over to a lawyer. So in the end, if the, if the case is won, it's not the, the plaintiff who gets the money. It is the lawyer. And the Washington Post documented this, and I, I highly recommend that, that you read that, that, uh, those stories. Good evening. Um, I was wondering, uh, I've lived in Baltimore County for like a couple of years, and I observed that um, it seemed like it's a push for Blacks to live out in the county now, opposed to the city. And I noticed that they're trying to rebuild the city. Could you explain this? Um, because it kind of <laughs> sounds like the uh, project that you mentioned, Remove Negro Project. Can you explain that in a modern day fashion? Well, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, and I'll give you a convoluted answer, but, but it is necessary to, to do that. Uh, the turning point, well, uh, in 1968, one year before I came to Baltimore, Baltimore had riots on a, a far wider scale, riots that were far more destructive than what happened uh, after Freddie Gray. And, and one of the, one of the uh, consequences of that was that uh, in integrated, integrating areas, uh, well, every, every, okay, let me, let me just say that when I came to Baltimore in 1969, the city was totally demoralized. Uh, everybody was fleeing. White flight had been going on for a couple of decades. Now businesses were fleeing as well. And, uh, and, and, and uh, as, as a reaction to nationwide rioting, 
the federal government uh, began uh, offering new loan products. Uh, up to that point, uh, blacks could not get uh, uh, housing loans even from the federal government. Now, new products were uh, created, including uh, uh, plans under which uh, blacks could buy existing houses uh, in, in uh, certain areas in the city for no money down. And the area near the Pimlico race course, Pimlico, it had gone through this ethnic transition from, from uh, Christian to largely Jewish. And then uh, for a couple of years before the riots, there had been black uh, home ownership uh, acquisitions in that area. And, and so, so, but when a new class of people taking advantage of these no payment, uh, no, no money down uh, mortgages, when these new uh, blacks from a different class of people started arriving, not only did the whites go berserk, but so did the uh, black uh, pioneers who had bought in Pimlico. And, and so this was the incident the, f the fact that they wanted to move somewhere else. This was the, the, the trigger that led to Liberty Road, the, the biggest concentration today of blacks in Baltimore. And that had been an area where in a, uh, the, the first neighborhood that changed was Luckern. Luckern had, uh, uh, un until, until about uh, seven years before, Lockern had banned Jews. When Jews started moving to Lockern, Christians fled. And now that blacks were coming, even though they were homeowners uh, from Pimlico, school teachers and so on, uh, now, now, now uh, the run continued. And so what, what happened was that Liberty Road then became de facto designated as the black area. And that's where the real estate industry steered black homeowners. Now, there is another component to your question, and that is uh, you can, uh, you can uh, create racial change in many ways. And I mentioned in my historical review that near the city hall area, there had, uh, one of the ways was to condemn for road construction and so on. And the same thing happened in Baltimore. The most destructive, uh, in, uh, the most destructive thing that ever happened in terms of, of uh, eroding Baltimore's cohesiveness and 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 and, and uh, urban fabric happened as a result of a 1944 study. Uh, the city hired Robert Moses, who who was a New York power broker. Uh, who, ha who was designing expressways, and, and uh, the city gave him a task to recommend a, s a solution to Baltimore's awful east-west connection problem. Uh, that, ha that was documented during the war. It was a terrible bottleneck. And so uh, Moses then uh, proposed to, to ram through an expressway through the uh, Howard Street retail district where all the major department stores were. So, so they had less reason to, to invest in anything there. They, they wanted to go to the suburbs. The, uh, the uh, road would have uh, saved the Roman Catholic Cathedral Basilica. It would have saved the, uh, the uh, Enoch Pratt Library and, and uh, Peabody uh, Institute, but but um, but in any case, nothing ever came of that uh, road. But the 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 thing that we have to remember is that uh, thousands and thousands of properties, mostly slum properties, were torn down for that road that never came, and and and. Uh, uh, these people then had to move to other neighborhoods. And, and in many cases, again, they were directed to neighbor, uh, neighborhoods that 
for, for the lack of any better expression, I'll call them at-risk neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were changing and really needed, needed uh, su support to, in, 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 their, in their efforts to stay viable. Instead, uh, people, of, um, pe pe people from other areas, people of different social background came in. And so, so uh, that again was, was an area that, that resulted in, in neighborhood change in, in various areas. I, uh, I know you said in your closing statement that it's sometimes hard to kind of look end on an optimistic note, but I was just wondering if you could tell us kind of what is the silver lining for kind of the future of Baltimore and what you kind of see with future rela race relations in the future? Well, the silver line is that uh, in economic terms, however bad the situation in Baltimore is, it has never gotten too bad, mostly because uh, so many of the residents depend on federal uh, grants, social, uh, so, uh, so, uh, social service grants. And so, so that's, that's one, one thing is that if, and this is a big if, if under the next president, the next Congress, uh, this system is continued, Baltimore is not going to throw, uh, gonna, uh, it's not going to fall through the, 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 the um, uh, floor. At the same time, uh, Baltimore, Baltimore is uh, a city that uh, certainly it benefits from its uh, proximity to, to, to Washington. And so what I think is, is may happen uh, in the end is something similar to Boston and uh, and and um, uh, Baltimore also has been promoted the city as a place for people uh, working in Washington to live the argument having been that it is cheaper to live in Baltimore and that may be true the 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 flip side unfortunately is that getting to Bal uh, from from Baltimore to Washington and back is becoming more and more difficult uh, for, for the most part, if you have to go to downtown Washington, uh, you don't want to drive. And, and the rail service, while improving, is, is kind of iffy. Uh, but but then, then what is the ultimate silver lining? The ultimate silver lining is in people, uh, is in, 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 in an entrepreneur that owns Under Armour. Under Armour is now developing Baltimore. I don't know whether you have uh, followed that, but there is a new inner harbor being created in South Baltimore on the middle branch of the Patapsco River. That was industrial land. Uh, and, and so Under Armour has, has bought all of that land and will uh, create a corporate headquarters there with all kinds of components hotels, businesses, and, and so, so this is how it's supposed to be working. It's, it's uh, supposed to be businesses that, that take the initiative and, and then plow back their, their profits to the city, and this is happening under, uh, uh, under, uh, under Armour. Now, it is also interesting that the standard practice in Baltimore has always been to uh, assume that in order to lure developers in Baltimore, one needs to start with subsidies. <clears throat> that nobody comes to Baltimore unless offered a subsidy. And, and this also is changing. Uh, and let me cite one example. Uh, Amazon came to Baltimore less than a year ago and went to the city and said, we are not here to beg for any money. What we want is we have a very tight timetable, so we don't want any needless red tape. If you can promise that we can create what we want uh, within that time frame, we come to Baltimore. If not, tell us now and we go somewhere else. But it's kind of interesting again that that uh, what what happened with Amazon was that they took over an old General Motors plant, and then they built two more huge warehouses for a distribution center, 
which now is also uh, triggering other development activity, commercial activity unrelated to, 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 to Amazon. What the problem is with the Amazon is that Baltimore's public transit system is horrendous. So Amazon is running its own bus company to get the employees that it needs to, 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 to its uh, facilities. But it's, it's kind of interesting that while Amazon doesn't necessarily beg for money, Baltimore's elected officials are so, uh, so uh, beholden to this old system of operating on the subsidies that recently, without Amazon even asking, the city council president gave them $100,000 so that they can run their bus system. So, I mean, these are the kinds of challenges that we, we, we will face now. And, and yes, there are some, 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 some uh, uh, silver linings. Let me uh, uh, make one, one final point. Uh, when Baltimore, uh, B Baltimore was a predecessor, uh, a, a trailblazing city during the racial change that started in the 1940s, late 1940s, when the Supreme Court first declared restrictive covenants unenforceable by courts. And then in 1954, when the Supreme Court desegregated schools, Baltimore was the only big city that desegregated immediately and system-wide. And so uh, as a result, we had Lots of white panic uh, when blacks started uh, coming to schools that, that had, had been previously white. Let me give you one example. Since the residential patterns were segregated, the, the initial impact of the 1954 school desegregation order was very limited. But at one school near the Mondamin Mall, uh, the school opened in September. It had had zero black students the previous spring. And now that uh, September, it had 44% uh, blacks. And one fifth of the remaining white students transferred out of the school during that single year. And so, so, uh, so what I'm saying is that as happened then for racial reasons, that, that today the school piece is the crucial piece in, in, in talking about Baltimore's future. Something has to happen. I mean, Baltimore has tried everything. There were, I don't know whether you know this, but there was a school in, in Kenya that Baltimore City ran on foundation money trying to, to find something that would make black kids motivated. And, and it, it did not meet the, the funders' expectations, so it no longer exists. But, but this, this is the major, major thing. And if, if the school piece somehow could be addressed, I would, I would have to revise my, my take on Baltimore's future. Thank you. I feel obligated to end you with a positive spin. Having grown up in Baltimore and worked for many years at Baltimore City Planning Department and several other city agencies, because one of the natural resources they have in Baltimore that you haven't talked about is the people. Uh, thank you. I don't disagree with you at all, but let me point out something. That the, the kind of uh, uh, civic organization infrastructure that used to work in Baltimore real well is pretty much uh, gone now. And let me give you one example. It used to be that the League of Women Voters had a monitor in all city council meetings. Uh, that no longer happens. Even the newspapers may not have anybody monitoring what's happening in City Hall. So, so while I agree with your optimistic uh, assessment on that score, 
I also want to point out that that uh, I don't think that the the conventional civic organizations have have uh, are ever going to have the kind of impact that they had when when Schaefer was was uh, 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 mayor. Uh, instead, we will be moving to mobilization through new me means of social media. And in that sense, it is going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, when we have the next city elections. Because uh, we had this uh, uh, Freddie, Gay, uh, Freddie uh, Gray uh, uh, thing that many people call, uh, they call it uprising. And, and in a way, it may have been an uprising, but that was then, and there has been very little follow-up. And so, so, so it's going to be very interesting to see. But, uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I love Baltimore City. It is, it is my adopted city. It is the city that I know better than any other city. And I'd like it to su uh, succeed. I live in the city, and, and, and uh, whoever is elected is going to be from the Washington area. Uh, either Edwards or, or um, uh, Van Holland. Both of them are from, from the Washington area. And Baltimore, for all these years, thought that it had political clout. And Baltimore's political clout is, is unfortunately decreasing. Good evening. Um, earlier, you mentioned, and uh, you made an interesting statement that you said that Baltimore would not get too bad. Um, in 2015, Baltimore had 344 homicides, which is the most in any city per capita on record. Um, and also, in 2015, there were the riots for Freddie Gray. Um, when looking at this information and understanding the reputation that this must have come along with for what Baltimore has to deal with now when speaking about investors or just about other American citizens looking in on the issues, what optimism can you spread about Baltimore that can help people want to help Baltimore? Because at this point, with the media defamation of Baltimore and the current situation of people in Baltimore, the, the hopes and the morale is very low. And maybe possibly candidates like DeRay McKesson, who do have an image of optimism, are doing well because Baltimore has lost a lot of its integral morale. So what can you, or any advice can you give to these college students about how to stay optimistic about Baltimore's situation and how to find out a new solution because the current one is not really working? Well, again, I come back to the, uh, thank you, I come back to the school piece. That is something that needs to be addressed. And if that can be addressed, and in a way it is being addressed, but it is, it is just, just uh, feel-good stuff at this point. Uh, we have a, an increasing number of charter schools. And I, for one, I am not convinced that charter schools achieve anything much better than public schools, right? ordinary public schools. But it is, it is something that makes parents happy because they have the feeling that they have more control over their kids' education, that it is not faceless bureaucrats on, on North Avenue who are taking this. Many of the mothers who are trying to keep to a job decide that it is easier to keep the kid home than to send the kid to, uh, to, to preschool, but the the uh, conditions of hopelessness and poverty are, are just, just uh, defeating those efforts. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I am, I am uh, and I, I don't want to sound negative, I'm realistic. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I see this city, and, and uh, uh, the fact is that most of the city departments have never been audited. There have been, there have been uh, decisions made, promises made about audits, but there have been no audits. So nobody knows uh, where the money goes. Uh, I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for attending. Uh, I think this is a very important topic, uh, and I think it should be discussed in college campuses nationwide uh, and in society in general. Um, 
So when you were talking, you said something about for the last 60 years, uh, the mayors of Baltimore have been Democrats. And I think over the last few decades, the, the, the governors as well. Um, so it seems like, you know, the Democratic politicians have uh, failed the African-American community, uh, which is strange because the Democratic Party positions themselves as the party of minorities. Do you think the best way to tackle the challenges in Baltimore is the social aspect, um, which is people's mindset, or the, po the political aspect, which is change to politicians? Well, in order for us to successfully change, uh, uh, elect politicians that uh, would, would make a difference, we need to change our own mindset. And, and, and unfortunately, what has happened is that all those, the political machines used to run the city, various political uh, machines. They used to be white machines, then there were some black machines and so on. Today, most of the machines are totally meaningless and something has to take their place. But the fact is that, that at, by the end of this decade, the millennials like you, are going to be the majority of voters. Uh, if we don't have political organizations in the fashion that we used to have, something has to take their place. And, and the answer to that is technology. And so how that is then going to uh, play out. And so if, if that is the message that people get about Baltimore, that means that people are going to be fearful. People will be uh, less trusting. And so, so there are these psychological mindset issues on many scores that need to be addressed. I'd ask everyone to thank our speaker this evening. Thank you very much for addressing some of the structural issues that we've been discussing in class.